So basically my task today is really to just kind of capture and, and I guess kind of consolidate a little bit some of the kind of key points that we've heard today from a lot of, I think, very interesting uh, and very informative speakers, particularly around the OEM piece to start. We're all here in this room today because of some of the external factors that are really driving change in our industry, particularly uh, uh, at the OEM side and how, that, how they're reacting to that, but then more particularly to draw it back to ourselves and uh, the retailer environment, particularly in the UK, and some of the challenges and opportunities that are there. But that key phrase that I'll keep coming back to, which is effectively supporting EV readiness and having EV readiness in our businesses to optimize the opportunities and to make sure that we, we minimize those risks, and indeed what kind of role MHA and indeed our supporting Alliance EV partners, many of whom you've heard from today, can play within that piece. So I was very pleased to, uh, to hear some of the points that Thomas was making in terms of his positioning earlier on, uh, because I wanted to just reflect very, very briefly on the fact that we are, the royal we, very, very important to uh, the UK and the UK economy. Uh, and uh, of course, this being an SMMT slide originally, which they used in their part of their Brexit discussions with, uh, with various interested parties, the key thing they've kind of missed off is the uh, over four and a half thousand uh, franchise dealers in the UK and that kind of over half a million employees uh, that Thomas referred to earlier on. But you can see from some of the key statistics highlighted on the slide that the automotive sec sector in its specific uh, OEM uh, guise as well as the wider OEM and retailer guise is still an incredibly powerful and influential body within the UK and a very, very important part uh, of the economy. And therefore, a lot of the pressures that we've heard about today that are being felt and some of the things I'll, I'll touch on uh, in a second as well within that environment, uh, it's sometimes easy to forget that, uh, that we are uh, as strong as we are and perhaps we need to, to reflect that a bit more in terms of the, uh, the key outside drivers that, that are impacting us. But nonetheless, when you look at the, the global goals and the European goals of, of uh, effectively reducing uh, emissions, fantastic progress has been made over the last few years. So a drop of over 30%, uh, percent, as you can see there, from the kind of change of the decade um, to where we are now. But I guess the point here, and we'll come back to this in a second, is despite that fantastic progress, uh, we've actually seen a bit of an, an increase uh, in overall emissions over the last couple of years. So we'll talk a little bit uh, more about that in a second. But there's some fairly key drivers behind that, particularly last year. I think one thing's very, very clear when you look at the OEM landscape at the moment, and that's the fact that uh, electrification is, is absolutely here to stay. So we've kind of had some debate and discussion around what's happening uh, with hydrogen, maybe hydrogen fuel cell in the sector, but we can see very, very overtly the amount of investment in R&D and production, whether it's in batteries or, or the vehicles themselves, is absolutely staggering and unprecedented. So whatever happens, electrification is here to stay and we have to be in every aspect as OEMs and retailers able to, to optimize that. So of course what we have now is a situation whereby, and it's again it's a little bit unusual in our industry, uh, in that we're having a radical change at a radical pace uh, being kind of thrust upon us without really the consumer being necessarily the heart of that change. And again we'll come to that in a second, but traditionally the consumer has influenced a lot more uh, the pace of change in our industry, but this is very, very regulatory um, uh, driven. Uh, and we know that the, uh, the new target, effectively, to come into play for OEMs, uh, subject to Brexit in, in certain cases, but certainly from a European point of view, of 95 grams uh, of CO2 per car will go live in 2021 20, uh, and is a very, very tough ask for most, uh, for most manufacturers. And they have to be, and are having to be, very, very uh, clever and fleet of foot about how they actually go towards uh, meeting those targets. So the target back in, the last target back in, in 2015, um, which was I think about a, a 130 grams, was achieved three years ahead of plan. I think in this particular example, then this is gonna be a struggle. This will be a lot tougher and people will have to be a lot more creative about how they go, uh, go about achieving that. So 2020 will be a year of transition. So effectively that 95 gram target will be targeted at 95% of the uh, lowest emitting uh, fleets that manufacturers sell during 2020. And then by 2021, it goes into the full 95 gram target. And unlike the previous scale uh, of uh, a penalty for not meeting that target, uh, which was, uh, I say, related to 2015, which was a sliding scale of euros relative to the emission, at this point, it's 95 grams 
uh, of CO2 as the target and 95 euros as the penalty for every gram over, um, over that particular target across vehicles sold in that year. And in this particular case for 2021, that will of course be across all cars sold. So we'll, we'll think a little bit about what that means and, and look at options in a second. But as you can see, the, the quote there by Herbert Dees, the, uh, the impact is potentially um, well, terrifying in many cases to, to the OEM environment. So I, I touched on the fact that OEM, uh, sorry, that uh, emissions have been slightly kind of heading in the wrong direction over the last, particularly the last year. So I, I guess it's not kind of massively surprising when you look at the reasons behind that. Obviously, the whole diesel piece has, has massively influenced that. Now, with RDE2 product coming in next year and availability of RDE2 diesel, that will start to rectify itself a little bit. At, uh, a little bit. But um, the shift to kind of heavier SUVs, not unsurprisingly, uh, has also kind of impacted the amount of, uh, uh, of CO2 uh, emitted. And if you look at um, how dealers will, will, sorry, how retailers and, uh, and OEMs together can look to impact uh, against and mitigate against these fines, then sales mix and model mix will become crucially important. And of course, you're, you're already experiencing that and have experienced that to a certain extent through, through 2019. This is only going to increase during 2020, of course. And that's where, as somebody else uh, mentioned earlier on, the whole point about exchange rate becomes very relevant as well, because against the backdrop of, of huge investment from the OEMs, they're also looking to optimize their revenues from a supply point of view by market. So some really kind of, you know, quite key macro factors affecting uh, and impacting effectively our day-to-day -day, uh, ability to sell product and make profit next year. Um, and I guess, you know, a couple of points there at the bottom around this kind of, as, as Tavares has called it, this toxic cocktail that could be in existence for the OEMs. And I think the last point is kind of quite relevant, you know, adverse profit impacts for, for key OEMs ranging from minus 7% up to minus 25% from 2021, assuming that they can't meet these very, very stringent targets. Now, of course, there are uh, different options available to them, whether it's super credits, there's more allowance. Uh, I think a zero emission vehicle counts for two vehicles within the fleet, by way of example. So there are things that they can do, but of course, the pace of this change and the impact of the fines is really driving the reason that we're all sat here in the room today. It's also important to remember the kind of um, long tail impact as well of this change. You know, we've touched on battery, battery technology, manufacturing, etc. The manufacturing base for the OEMs is changing as well, and particularly because there is such a high level of, uh, of employment within the sector across Europe and particularly in the UK, then there is an impact. And this again is an SMMT slide where they're looking at that potential opportunity cost impact and indeed job loss by the time you get to kind of 2040. Uh, if uh, we don't keep up in terms of pace of, of battery uh, development and manufacture within uh, the UK and within the, uh, the, supply, uh, the supply sector. So this is uh, a, the road to zero again. Uh, as you can see, that's, that's, that's featured in, in a few of the presentations today. Effectively, the government, uh, as has been said before, is driving us towards uh, this kind of 50% of new cars sold uh, to be zero emissions. Um, and if we look at the kind of 2025 landmark, which is perhaps a little bit more relevant for us here, um, the big progress review date is due there, but already this is expecting us to get close towards a sales mix of around about 30% uh, within the UK. So that's already, albeit in overall volume terms, uh, quite a lot less than the ICE cars, obviously, that we're selling. That's already, in terms of timing of change, quite significant before you even get to thinking about far out in, in 2030 and, of course, in 2040. But just short term, this, uh, this rapid increase in terms of the availability and sale of uh, pure electric cars and plug-in uh, electric cars is going to massively impact all of our, all of our businesses. Uh, this is reflected globally as well. This isn't just a UK and European piece. Again, if you look at the, the bottom slide, these are two graphs from uh, Deloitte and from Bloomberg. If you look at Bloomberg on the bottom there, we can see that the anticipated global share of EV by the time we get to 2030 will be best part of 30% of the new car market. So that's something like just under 40 million vehicle sales will be EV in their nature by the time we get to that point. And that's 11% forecast by the time we get to 2025. So on that basis alone, you can see the, the grade of change and the, and the uh, uh, the, the actual tra trajectory of that graph, I think, telling the whole story. 
So in terms of um, bringing it back down to, I guess, the UK specific and where are we at the moment, then of course the biggest movement we've seen so far is probably the decline in diesel, which you can see in the top graph going all the way down to just under um, 0.7 million sales uh, as of the summer of this year. And of course we've seen the declining overall car market as well that was touched on this morning. So looking a bit further forward, as we can see at the bottom, with the availability of RDE2, we'll see some stabilising in terms of that diesel decline, and that will uh, support an overall stabilising of market as well, which is forecast up to kind of round about the end of next year. But of course, we've also seen, as I said, this increase in EV and plug-in uh, EV vehicles coming in to also support that. But of course, overall market conditions remaining very challenging, but already we're seeing and will see uh, quite a significant mixed shift. And again, Thomas touched on this. Well, to answer your, your kind of question, in terms of customer choice and the availability within showrooms, we can see here something like 250 uh, models, EV models, in market in the UK um, by sort of 2021, late, late 2021. So compared to where we are now, so the consumer, who, who we know is, not, is already not necessarily driving this change in the same way that perhaps they have done historically, is going to be faced with a massive choice in market in a very, very short period of time. Um, the consumer challenges, as we're starting to talk about, the consumer remain, but I think the interesting point to draw out here, this compares us against some of the other uh, major global and European markets, but the interesting point really is the fact that price premium has really kind of come into play within the top three. So it's all been about, historically, about the range-related items, but now price has escalated up to, to second place. But of course, when we look at uh, what's happening in terms of battery technology cost savings through production, then we can see the tipping point between the price premium for ICE cars and EV cars coming into play. Probably the prediction, prediction is around about 2025 when that will start to even off. So again, at that point, and with a number of vehicles we're seeing being launched ahead of that, then we will see, I think, a significant change in the market that supports those kind of projections that we saw earlier. Uh, James Greenleaf mentioned earlier on that uh, as, a, as a government and as a as UK uh, supporting uh, project for the government, they haven't really supported the, uh, and incentivised the change and the move towards low emission vehicles. It's round about one and a half billion uh, pounds worth of investment across the period, so 2015 if it continues through to 2021, of which I think if you look at the two mainstream manifestos, so not the Green Manifesto, which is round about uh, I think uh, something like £700 uh, billion pounds of, uh, of spend uh, in, the, uh, in the space of, uh, of reducing emissions and carbon neutrality. If you look at Labour and Conservative, then they're much more aligned with uh, spend in this area, incentivisation towards uh, EVs at closer to kind of £600 odd million. Pounds. So I think whoever gets in, in that regard, will see a kind of continuation. But as was commented on, arguably from a global point of view, not really that much incentive which is why this tipping point between ICE uh, and uh, an EV uh, is going to become very important in terms of the price premium. <laughs> Equally, if you look at China, who are obviously lauded, uh, understandably, for being the, uh, the mainstream EV market, which they are, very, very, very sensitive to government incentive. Okay, so all of this directionally is, uh, is directing us towards you know, this point that things have to be done a little bit differently. So the change may be uh, more radical in some areas than others, but nonetheless there is some change required. And, and the, the, the grouping that I've put here for these, for these considerations within this change platform, surprise, surprise, are not dissimilar whether you're, we're in conversation with an OEM or, or indeed within, within a retailer network. Uh, and they very much, I think, fall into these kind of four key phases. Uh, we've heard today that you know, when you're looking particularly at investments, a, a lot around the planning piece, building it into one-year budgeting, three-year business planning, as a, as a, as a, whether it's capital cost, an investment, or a people cost, or a process cost. But considering it within planning, short and long term, is, is absolutely key. And then reflecting that in, in the numbers in terms of investment that's required, but also starting to think about getting the right kind of advice and guidance to support that planning process. And we've seen today, you know, there's many different uh, actors in the, in the arena at the moment. There's many different stakeholders. Everyone will, will tell you they're the best at what they do. So getting good advice and guidance uh, from independent specialist sources is key. Uh, infrastructure and energy, we've heard a lot about that today. Um, fascinating. I've learned a hell of a lot. But this whole fundamental question about what is needed for when and how much is it going to cost, 
relative to what the customer actually requires and the capacity constraints that are there, I think, again, is kind of critical to try and get right for, for all of your, uh, your, uh, your CapEx uh, investments. Uh, and then the, the, the people piece. You know, we're working within uh, our EV Alliance partner team, and I'll talk a bit, a bit more about them in a second. We're working with a, an important organization called Intuitive Learning that are very active in this area in terms of ongoing, consistent, embedded knowledge for your teams. So EV ready teams, EV readiness within your teams, whether it's service, parts, or new or used sales, is critical. I and mean, keeping them up to speed is also absolutely critical. Because as witnessed today, you know, things are changing so quickly, particularly in the energy and infrastructure uh, uh, space. So what might that look like uh, for, uh, for you guys in, in the room in terms of you know, kind of walking away from here today and thinking, OK, I heard some great stuff. And some of it's kind of helicoptered up here. Some of it's 2030, 2040. And some of it's actually very immediate. So what does, that, what does that mean for you? Well, I tried to kind of capture it a little bit from uh, McIntyre Hudson's point of view with that kind of opening sentence. So kind of forgive me if I read it out. But uh, uh, effectively, EV readiness is a plan based on a balanced and an objective advice from really, if you can, subject matter specialists. And I think what we're trying to do, and working with Steve and the team, is to build an alliance of partners that can deliver, to a greater or lesser extent, across all of the key areas in this territory, that kind of independent advice and guidance. And again, I tried to, tried to capture, capture it in these kind of four key areas. And what we believe we can do now at MHA is to create this kind of one-stop shop um, for the provision of this kind of expertise and this kind of uh, practical support and guidance, whether it's in phase one, which is around proper commercial planning to support your EV readiness short and long term, whether it's around infrastructure and energy, and we've got obviously a great deal of specialist resource to draw in this area, but really understanding what the requirements are there and what the options are there is, is obviously key to the investments that you will make in the short and the medium term, but also getting the people piece right. Because again, at the end of the day, our industry, more than probably any other, remains about people and people buying from people and getting that right level of consultation uh, and uh, advice and guidance available through you uh, within the retail environment to the uh, consumer or uh, uh, certainly to our potential customers in the future. And then making sure that it's everything is delivered within that plan in the right kind of time scale. So we put down sensible, realistic plans for delivery across all of those kind of uh, three key areas that I've just touched on. So I touched on also the, uh, the different members of the alliance. So we've heard from most of the people within uh, McIntyre Hudson's uh, EV Alliance partner team today. There are a few others in here, some of which we, we haven't heard from. Any data are one who you think you may have heard from them in the past but also intuitive learning I've just mentioned. So really, uh, uh, I think, cutting edge in the field of using artificial intelligence to support embedded uh, learning within, within teams, and that applies to uh, compliance learning as much as it does uh, also to the, um, the uh, product and the electric uh, vehicle piece. Um, but as we've seen, consultancy specialists across all aspects of this uh, complicated but fascinating and exciting and challenging time in our industry.